Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor Lab and BioArchive. With me I have Lynn McQuart from the University of Rochester, New York. Lynn, welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. Thank you, Richard. Um, and welcome back. Welcome yes. back. Have, we've just been talking about how you've been here many times before. We're surrounded by many people who've also <gasps> visited Cold Spring Harbor in the past. Yes. So when did you first arrive here? Uh, do you mean historically, when was my first Cold Spring Harbor yeah, meeting? Yeah, yeah. I, I shouldn't be embarrassed. I think I'm beyond embarrassment. I was a graduate student, uh -huh. and I was studying the E. coli lactose operon, and I remember it was 1976. Wow. <laughs> so that's, that, is, that is a long time ago. I'm still alive <laughs> and kicking. <laughs> well, it's very, it's very nice to have you, have you back, and I, kn and I know you're going to be talking later in the meeting about uh, nonsense-mediated decay, which was something that you basically discovered shortly after that time, is that correct? You know, I worked in a lab as an undergraduate, and I loved working in the lab. And when I went to graduate school, I wanted to continue working on a eukaryote. But uh, I, I loved the program I was in. It was the biochemistry program in Madison, Wisconsin. But it, it didn't really have, it had one person working on eukaryotes that weren't plants. Uh -huh. And so I ended up working on E. coli, and it served me well because it gave me a good uh, basis for molecular biology, and of course we use bacteria all the time in expressing human genes. But when I chose my postdoc, I, I went back to study humans actually and human diseases. And uh -huh. uh, it was towards the end of my postdoc and also in starting my own lab where we discovered NMD by studying mRNA half-lives uh -huh. in bone marrow cells. Okay. Nucleated bone marrow cells from patients in the case of NMD with beta zero thalassemia. Right. So, so for those who have kind of forgotten um, their molecular biology, nonsense mediated decay. What, what is it? What's the problem that's being solved here? And what's the first? In human diseases of the type that we studied, translation of an mRNA terminates prematurely. Mm -hmm. So the disease-associated mutation is either a frame shift or a nonsense mutation that generates a premature termination codon, and that triggers decay of the mRNA. This is a good thing in the sense that if a cell were to make truncated proteins, they could be toxic. Right. And we figured out the rules for how a cell differentiates a normal termination codon that generally doesn't trigger mRNA decay from a premature termination codon that generally does. So this is basically, yeah, so it's getting an, arm, uh, an mRNA that's too short and therefore would create, if translated, create a peptide that could gum up the work, That's right, basically. so the f open reading frame of the mRNA is too short and right. therefore the protein would be truncated and it could gum up the machine it works in in the cell. Yeah. So, so, I mean, how does the cell decide it's too short? Well, it turns out splicing in the nucleus, so we're talking about the splicing of a precursor to mRNA mm -hmm. in the nucleus, deposits what we called a long time ago a mark right. that persists until the first round of translation of the mRNA, and that occurs in the cytoplasm. Right. Okay. So at the time, that was unexpected, and we figured this out not only by studying beta zero thalassemia and other human diseases, but by then generating reporters. So we didn't have to rely on patient samples anymore, where we could move introns around and we could move premature termination codons around and, and realize that there must be a mark that persists during that first round of translation because we knew NMD was largely restricted to newly synthesized RNA. Right. And then uh, the mark we renamed when I talked to Melissa Moore and we collaborated with a postdoc, Ari Lair, who was starting in my lab and then moved to her lab. We had this arrangement beforehand. The mark, uh, we renamed it the exon junction complex. Right, so this is, like, this is like a protein complex that sits on a splice site. That's right, so it sits. So Ari figured out this complex of proteins sits 20 approximately 20 to 24 nucleotides upstream of exon exon junctions generated by splicing on the mRNA. And this complex, we figured out, and Joan Stites' lab also figured out, uh, 
consists of some of the NMD factors that we named after their orthologs in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We, in, we named them UPF proteins. Right. And the EJC, if it persists on an mRNA that prematurely terminates translation, so you can imagine, depending upon how many introns are in a pre-mRNA, you can expect to have that many exon junction complexes, at one at each exon exon junction. Mm -hmm. And as the ribosome moves, and if there's a translation event, it can be premature, can be also the normal termination codon. That fails to remove a downstream EJC, then the mRNA will be targeted for NMD. Right, so it's basically what the cell's doing is it's, it's the ordering of the, the, um, the stop site and these, that it says, wait a second, there's one behind where it, where it should be. That's correct. Right. That's okay. right. Yeah, okay. the ribosome in the process of translation can remove them. Right. And we figured out before we knew where the EJC was, a rule. And that rule said, if translation terminates 50 to 55 nucleotides or more upstream of an X and X injunction, then the mRNA will be targeted for NMD. And now that we know where the EJC is and right. we know where the leading edge of the terminating ribosome would be, it makes sense. Right, right. And this is what you refer to as pioneer translation. Is well, right? so this happens during a pioneer round of translation, but that was another surprise in the sense that when people at the time were thinking about <clears throat> mRNA translation, they were thinking about mRNA that had, it's called eukaryotic initiation factor 4E at the cap. Mm -hmm. right. And it's true, that mRNA that's bound by EIF4E at the cap produces the bulk of cellular proteins. Right. But because we knew NMD was largely restricted to newly synthesized RNA, and we knew that there was a different cap binding protein that was acquired by the pre-mRNA, uh -huh. I asked a postdoc to just test, is it mRNA that has this cap that's acquired very early on in mRNA biogenesis that's still there during the pioneer round of translation? And the answer turned out to be yes. So we define the pioneer round during which NMD largely occurs as the translation of mRNA that's bound at the cap, not by EIF4E, but by CBP80, cap binding protein 80, and its binding partner, CBP20. Right, so that's a timing event that you can then define the processes as to when it's happening. It's a timing event because, yes, we've shown there's a precursor product relationship between the right. pioneer round and steady state rounds of translation in mammals, not in uh -huh. yeast, but in mammals. And uh, we think of it as uh, a completely different mRNA in the sense of the proteins that are associated with it compared right. to the steady state translation initiation complex. So the pioneer translation initiation complex not only has CBP80 and 20 at the cap, but it has the EJCs. Right, right. So what, what I mean, you mentioned a group of um, UPFs where they, they're, they're, they're in those, um, uh, in those EJCs. What, what are the proteins there? and how, how is this coordinated with degradation of the RNA? Well, we've done a lot of work on understanding how proteins rearrange uh -huh. on an NMD target during the process of NMD, including the pioneer run of translation and the decay steps. So the key NMD factor is an ATP-dependent RNA helicase called UPF1. Uh -huh. And we find it either transiently or weakly associating with CBP80. Right. To see that interaction, we have to cross-link before we lyse cells. And then we found that CPP80 escorts UPF1 to the translation termination complex together with a kinase, SMUG1, that phosphorylates UPF1, not as a part of the termination complex, but later when CPP80 escorts UPF1 and its kinase to the EJC. Right, okay. So there's a lot of other proteins I won't talk about, but the Activation of NMD is when the kinase is now free, not, not free, floating away in the right. cell, but is able to, it's not restricted, it's not inhibited, right. and it can then phosphorylate UPF1 at the EJC. And that's the, that's the critical event. That's critical. That's a critical event. And then there's a step of translational repression we found that's important for decay. We know the mechanism of that. That also involves activated UPF1. And then 
So that's a feedback to stop the um, translation. More translation right. initiation. Right. So right. there are ribosomes on an mRNA that starts being degraded during the process of NMD. But what happens is there's an inhibition of further translation initiation events. Right. So phospho-UPF1 goes back and prevents the 60S ribosomal subunit coming from in. right coming in and joining the 43S, uh, which includes the 40S ribosome poised at the translation initiation codon. Right. And if you don't have that, you don't get decay. Right, and then you get these, these peptides. And then you get decay of the mRNA. And we know that decay can be from the 5 prime end, it could be from the 3 prime end, and or endonucleolytically. Right, and you, meant, and, and you mentioned that um, NMD is not the only pathway for this. There's several parallel pathways. Is that true? Oh, I see. Uh, you know, proteins multitask in cells. And the way that we've discovered uh, mind-blowing pathways is by looking to see what else in the cell does this RNA helicase, UPF1, interact with. Uh -huh. And by yeast to hybrid, we found that Stauffen interacts with UPF1. And there is a pathway that we've called Stauffen-mediated mRNA decay that's also dependent upon translation. Right. And the way that UPF1 is recruited to that RNA downstream of usually the normal termination codon right. is via a Stauffen binding site and Stauffen binding and recruiting UPF1. So when translation terminates, usually normally, but it doesn't have to be, and Stauffen isn't removed downstream because mm. UPF1 is enriched there, I think the pathways converge. And right. this pathway is not restricted to newly synthesized RNA. It targets both uh, the pioneer round and steady state rounds of translation. And so what's what's it being used for and during those steady state rounds of translation? So it is being used to regulate differentiation processes. Okay. So if you'd like me to make it even more complicated, <laughs> it turns out that NMD and Stauffen mediated mRNA decay, SMD, are in competition. Oh, okay. And they're in competition because UPF1, it functions in both pathways, mm -hmm. and UPF1 can either bind to UPF2, which is important for NMD, or Stauffen, which is important for SMD. Right. During myogenesis, the efficiency of SMD goes up. And that's important, for example, there's a, a natural SMD target that is important to keep myoblasts in an undifferentiated state, so mm. get rid of that mRNA and its encoded protein, and that'll let the cells differentiate. So that's a way of bringing specificity into the process, is it? And Additional yeah. by uh, inhibiting, uh, excuse me, by, by having uh, SMD be more efficient, NMD becomes less efficient, and that's important because myogenin, which is important for the differentiation process, mm -hmm. needs to be produced. Right, right. So the cell has evolutionarily, I think, used these pathways as a way to regulate not only myogenesis, but other differentiation processes like adipogenesis and, right. and others. Yeah. I mean, you, I noticed in your abstract you mentioned um, regulation of um, uh, apoptosis right. and the way in which this pathway was used f to, 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 to control that, but it didn't sound like decay was the, the aim here. Well, this wasn't an NMD process, it was using the same um, machines, okay. is that correct? So, so that's an interesting point that you make. It is NMD, but it turns out, why do we have NMD? First of all, we make a lot of mistakes when we process our pre-mRNAs. Um, we have a lot of alternative splicing, we have a lot of alternative 3' information, and when we make mistakes because of the flexibility in those processes, NMD gets rid of mistakes we make all the time. Right. On top of that, there are approximately 10% of our messages that are natural NMD targets. So it still is NMD, Right. And the normal termination codon can be used to trigger the process. Right. So it's not really nonsense then. You know, so this is, um, so I wanted to call Stauffen mediated mRNA decay, Stauffen mediated NMD. And people said, no, 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 no. Nonsense means PTC. But actually, of course it doesn't. It right. means no sense. 
Right, okay. So, you know, it's uh, semantics. Uh-huh. <laughs> but anyway, what happens is during uh, severe DNA damage where it behooves the cell to trigger apoptosis, the key NMD factor, UPF1, mm-hmm. is cleaved substoichiometrically. It's not a complete cleavage of UPF1. A fraction of UPF1 is cleaved. Right just enough to inhibit NMD so that among the 10% of natural NMD targets that are now increased in abundance uh-huh. and can make proteins are those that encode pro-apoptotic proteins. Right. So it is NMD, um, and NMD is used as a rheostat by yeah. cells to create to a adapt. kind of global adaptation. That's right. Right. Okay. Now, are all the natural NMD targets pro-apoptotic? No. No. They're upregulated, they're translated, they're producing proteins, but they're, it's background gene expression. Right, it doesn't, right. It's not pertinent to the key process, which also has a lot of other apoptotic um, caspase-mediated events ongoing. So are you, I mean, so you, you mentioned myogenesis, apoptosis, are there like a whole host of different you processes name it, that the are going to be protein regulated response. You know, so the other way to think about NMD is it keeps cells at a homeostatic point until a stress or a change in environment gets bad enough so mm. that the appropriate response will be, be triggered. Right, oh I see, okay. Well, it sounds like there's still quite a lot to be looking into and um, we, we wish you luck with that. Well, thank it's, you. It's been, it's been great talking to you, Lynn. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you, Richard.